Good morning. Uh, we all need to pray for our pastor. Uh, he's supposed to be here this afternoon, or uh, preach today, but uh, we still need to pray for him. He's still not feeling well. And he asked me to teach Sunday school this morning, and I'm just thankful that God still use, wants to use me, so I hope you will endure. <laughs> Today we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, and uh, we're going to look at God's description of a wise man. I've been looking at this for quite a while, and I'm always amazed at how much there is about wisdom in the Bible. It's uh, kind of overwhelming at times when you get to looking at up certain words in the Bible. Let's pray. Our dear, precious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for giving me the opportunity to come up here and preach your word, Lord, teach it. And I pray for the gift of teaching today, Lord. I pray that you'll help this stammering tongue, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you'll open up the hearts of those who, that are here, Lord, to hear the message and to take it into their heart and to act upon it. Lord, I love you and I praise your name. And I know that you're coming back soon, Lord, and time's running out. Lord, we pray for our pastor, Lord, that you'll give him the strength that he needs, Lord. Pray that you'll calm his heart, Lord, and strengthen him. Lord, we love our pastor and we, we want to see him in good health. Lord, we need his him to teach us, Lord, and to preach to us. We need to learn your word, but Lord, it's our responsibility too, Lord, to, to get into your word and to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman, need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, I pray that you'll encourage us to, to look more at your word and to study it. For I say, Jesus Christ, my blessed Lord and Savior, amen. My wife, when I told her what I was going to preach, she said, well, that's a Christmas message. And I said, well, Christmas is every day. But this is about the wise men. And uh, we're going to be looking real close about why did God call these men wise. And starting in verse 1, And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it was written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when thou found him, bring me word again, that I may worship him also. <laughs> when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, a star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasure, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The first question you want to ask, these men weren't Jews. So why were they out looking for this child? Why were they so interested in this Jewish king that was supposed to be born? Then you have to ask your, yourself a question. 
Why did God call the, these men wise? I mean, when you get out in a starry night and you see a star, do you jump in your car and, and take off and drive until you find that star? People would think you're nuts. You know, I've always heard that, that these, these men, you know, when I was growing up, that these men were um, astrologers, and they searched the stars, and they saw this star, and they knew from studying the stars that this star was, belonged to Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the Jews, and it doesn't add up. It just doesn't add up. So why were these men called wise? Why were they out looking for this Messiah? I had to find an old dictionary in order to find out the proper definition of wise because these new ones are kind of messed up. But the old definition of wise is properly having knowledge, hence having the power of discerning and judging correctly of the discriminating of a discriminating between what is true and what is false. So these men were in search of truth. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 15, it says, The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ears of the wise seek knowledge. So a wise man is someone who's always seeking the truth, always seeking out knowledge. But the Bible goes on a little bit farther, and he says, you know, you have to ask a question, okay, you got this knowledge, now what are you going to do with it? In Proverbs 15, 7, it says, The lips of the wise disperse knowledge. That's very convicting, isn't it? But the heart of the foolish doth not so. These men had knowledge. They read the word of God. Where is, where is truth found? What's the Bible say? In uh, John chapter 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. If you're going to seek out truth, you're going to go, have to go to the Bible. Well, you say, these people didn't have the Bible. Well, let's wait a minute. Let's look at this a little bit. These men from, were from the east. They weren't from the west like the Catholics and the south and all these different parts of the world. They were from the east. If you take a, a map and you look at Jerusalem and you go straight across east... Where do you go? You go to a place called Babylon or uh, Iraq in the modern uh, uh, maps. So these men were from Babylon. Where did the Jews spend 70 years in captivity? Babylon. So these men had the word of God. They probably studied the word of God. They, those, that word of God was probably handed down to them to study because they saw what miracles went on in Babylon while the Jews were there. Right? Am I, am I reaching out there too far? I don't think so. These men had the word of God. They read the word. How many of us read the word? How many of us study the word. Well, these men had the word of God. They had Genesis all the way to Jeremiah. And they studied the word. They, they broke it down. They digested it. They went uh, word for word. And they took the word of God and they took it into their hearts. Now, so Start at the beginning. Years ago, I was an investigator for a, for a company, and I had to answer all these questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? So you have to answer questions in order to, to, make, a, a proper, um, to, to make a proper investigation on something. And when in Genesis chapter 1, you read about the creation. And they read about how God created the heavens and the earth. They also read about the fall of man. And when they got down to uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, 
And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle, above all every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Then it goes on to 15, it says, And I will put an enmity between thee and the, the, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So these wise men were looking at Genesis, and they said, Wow, God is going to send his seed through a woman. So they read a little farther, and they got to Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, it says, in verse 26, it says, And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Sham, and Canaan shall be his servant. So God was going to use the Oriental race, the Shemite race. Well, they said, well, that's, that's okay. God's got a seed, and God's going to use the tribe of, Sh the, the nation of Sham, which that nation makes up Jews, Indians, Orientals, uh, over half of, well, about a third of the population of the world. But God was going to use Sham of the, of the three sons of Noah. And then he said, okay, but we're going to go a little farther, and we're going to read Genesis chapter 49. And it's in Gen Genesis chapter 49, verse 8, it says, Judah, thou art he whom the, thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son... Thou art gone up, he stooped down, he crouched as a lion, as a lion, as an old lion, who shall rouse him up. They got to verse 10, they said, well, look at this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. I said, okay, wow. Now we got, we got a seed we got Sham, and now we got Judah. That's where the seed's going to come through, Judah. So they, they knew that, they also knew that, that this, this child was going to be a king. And they got to Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and shall destroy all the children of Seth. There's going to be a star associated with this, this, this child, this, this, this man that God's going to send. And these Jews, these uh, wise men, they knew that God would have to send someone that could rule over this world. They saw what Nebuchadnezzar, they saw that Cyrus and uh, Alexander the Great, and they saw Rome, and they saw how corrupt people become when they become king and, and rule over the world. And they figured, if God's going to straighten this out, he's going to have to send a special person that can rule over the world. And it couldn't be just any, anybody it had to be a, a God-man. It couldn't be an ordinary man. It had to be a God-man. And these men, these, these wise men, knew that God was going to have to send his son. And they went a little further, and they got to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35. He says, I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which he is in his mind, in his heart, and in his mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. So he's going to have to send not only a, a king, but he's going to have to have a priest, because these, these wise men knew that there had to be a mediator between God and man, someone who could, could uh, defend man because of the fact that man is nothing but dust. He's a sinner. He has to have an atonement. 
So the wise man knew that God was going to send a seed. He was going to do it through Cham. He was going to use Jacob's son, Judah. He would be a king, and there would be a star associated with him, and he would be a priest. The wise men knew this. They trusted the Bible because they not only read the Bible, but they actually believed the Bible. Imagine that. Somebody that believes the Bible, believes God's word. And then what did they do? They acted on it. But you, you say, well, okay, they knew that the Messiah was going to come. But when? When would the Messiah come? So they went to Isaiah chapter 44, 28. And they said, when the Messiah comes, Israel's going to have to be a nation again. And right now, they were in Babylon. But they saw the, 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 the sequence of events that took place to put Israel back into is, uh, the land of Israel. And they said, if God can do that, he can do anything. But he told the, the Jews that they were going into captivity, and they, he, God gave the name of the person who was going to send them back into the land. Because the book of Isaiah was written oh, quite a while before this king even came on the scene, before this king was even born. When you go to Isaiah chapter 44, 28, it says, That saith of Cyrus... He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even shall saying to, to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundations shall be laid. Well, you say, well, that's nice. But you go to a book called Ezra, written a hundred or so years later, Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, here's this king. He's reigning his first year. Guess what he does? That the word of the Lord of the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stir up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and to put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and hath charged me to build him the house of Jerusalem, which is Judah. So the wise men knew that the temple would have to be rebuilt. And the Jews would have to return to Israel. And they saw that in the writings and their own history. So they were convinced that the Bible was true and every, everything about the Bible was true and that God was going to send a seed and God was going to send it through Shem and God was going to send it through Judah and God was going to have a star associated with him. He's going to be a king and he's going to be a priest. But that doesn't answer the question when. So they went to the book of Daniel, which was written in Babylon during Babylonian captivity. And they went to Daniel chapter 9, they went to verse 24, and they read about the 70 weeks. And seven, 70 weeks are determined upon my, thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgressions and to make the end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision, the prophecy, and to anoint the Most High. Well, that's interesting. That goes right along with a priest, reconciling, a reconciliation of man to God. But look what it says in 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore the, and to build the Jerusalem, Unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks, threescore, and two. And the streets 
shall be built again and the walls even in troublous times. God was going to send the Jews back and he was going to rebuild Jerusalem and it was going to last for 483 years. But look what the next verse talks about. And after three score and two weeks, that's 434 years, shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. That means that Jesus Christ wasn't going to die for himself. He was going to die for someone else. Guess who he died for? Yeah, if you can't say me, you need to get on your knees. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the end of the sanctuary. The Jews, these wise men knew that the Jews were going to return to the land. They knew that, that from the time that the proclamation came out, which was 536, you had to subtract 434 years to get to, to the Messiah. But that doesn't answer all the question. When will he be born? They knew he was going to be a priest. So they went back to numbers. See what the, they have to say about the priest. In Numbers chapter 4, verse 3, it says, From 30 years old and upward until even 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. So he had to be at least 30 years old. So it's subtracted 30 years from that. And that would give the approximate time when Jesus Christ was going to be born. And I've seen the calculations one time, and it's to the day. And when you look at it, and you start studying the Bible a little closer, you can even find out the exact day when Jesus Christ was going to be born. He's going to be born on the Feast of Tabernacles. Guess what they, they determined? They said that they went back and they went back and did some studying and, and figuring and, and uh, this guy back in the, uh, even before, I think it was in the 1800s, come up and said, Christ was born on October 10th, 4004. And uh, that would put it right at the time of tab the Feast of Tabernacles. When the Feast of Tabernacles, the first time, the first fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles was when God created the temple. And Christ, uh, God came down and dwelt amongst men. The second time is when Jesus Christ came as a child. He tabernacled with man. Now he tabernacles in our heart. But when one day he's going to tabernacle in a physical body, a physical reign with us. And I'm waiting for that day, and I can't wait. The way the world is getting, I just can't wait. So they knew he was going to be a prophet, a priest, and a king. And they knew the approximate time. So when they saw his star, they said, pack up the bags boys let's go now they said that you know they say there's three wise men there could have been more there could have been 30 there could have been 50 or 100 but they were willing to act on the word they read the word they believed the word and then they acted on the word a lot of us we read the word we believe the word so we say but we never act on the word. You have to act on the word of God. If you don't act, what happens? Nothing. Nothing. When the, when the wise men went to, the, to uh, King Herod, they expected to, to find everybody looking for the Messiah. But nobody was looking for the Messiah. These non-Gentile, these Gentiles were, were looking for the Messiah, but the Jewish nation wasn't looking for the Messiah. And they went in there and they go, they said, well, the Herod says, where's these, uh, 
where's this child going to be born? And they go, well, you know, everybody's been talking about this, but nobody, it's been going on for years, and he's not, they've been talking about this for, for hundreds of years, and it's never happened, but if he's going to be born, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. The Jews didn't believe their own scriptures, the ones that God gave them. They didn't believe it, but these Gentiles did. They believed it enough to travel hundreds of miles, leave their families, leave their jobs, buy gifts, and travel for probably a year because he wasn't a baby. He was a child. It could have took him two years to get there. It could have took him a year, and then they got to travel back. They left their families all that time just to see this young child because they believed the word of God and they want to act on it and they want to see this child for themselves. They believe more than most people in this church. And you say, oh, no, we got the best church in the whole world. Let me tell you something. We live in the Laodicea church age. You know what that means? We're a bunch of hypocrites. We don't do what we say we're going to do. If we if we did what we were going to uh, what we say, this church would be booming. Because this is one of the last oases in this world where you can hear the word of God being preached. The biggest problem with churches is the same problem they had during the book of Judges, the same time uh, the same problem that they had during the, uh, uh, when the Jews went into captivity, the same problem that the, the wise men ran into when they got to Jerusalem, there was a famine in the land, a famine of the word of God. No one believes it anymore. Shame on us. If we believed it, we'd be doing something about it. We get all hyped up in our little world, our little minds, and we don't even think about what Christ did for us on the cross at Calvary. It makes me mad. I get tired of talking to people at work. They say they're Christians and they cuss the other word. Or they talk about their their sexual lives and all these other perversions. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of this world because every time you turn around, you can't watch TV anymore because they're throwing homosexuality at you yeah. and trying to say, you better accept it. Yeah. No, I will not. Right. I will not accept any perversion. I accept this word. Mm-hmm. And if you don't like it, don't have nothing to do with me because we're not alike. I'm not changing. God already changed me. I can't change back. And I don't want to change back. But Herod knew, Herod believed more than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He, was, he believed enough to kill innocent babies. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The other day we were talking about, uh, we are talking about this world, last Sunday school lesson. And I raised my hand, I want to say, listen, the same problem in the book of Judges, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They don't believe the word. And guess what happened after that? A guy named Saul came on the scene, a type of antichrist. We're looking at the antichrist coming on the scene any day now. Because man has turned his back on the word of God and they've taken the other books. The reason the Jews didn't, weren't looking for Jesus Christ is because they were reading the Talmud. And when the Talmud was more important than the, the true scriptures, when Jesus Christ came on the scene, they didn't recognize him. But these wise men had the scriptures and they recognized him. They knew who he was. Second Peter chapter 3 Three says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? 
For since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. When the, when the wise men found the, the young child, in verse 11, it says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. They fell down in complete obedience to this child because they knew who this child was. This child was the King of kings and Lord of lords. This child was born to die for the sins of the world, but he wasn't going to stay dead. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is a gift for a king. They knew that he was going to be king. They knew it so much that they gave the most valuable thing you can give someone, gold. When Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon, she brought gold. They knew that they needed a man to come into this world, a God-man to come into this world and rule over man because man was so corrupt. Power corrupts. Absolute power absolutely corrupts. And we see what we've got in our, in our leading our world today. We need, they, they knew that we needed a man-God to rule over us. They brought frankincense. Frankincense is an incense for the priest in the temple. And they said, we need a priest, a mediator between God and man. And 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We need a mediator. We need someone that will, will go between us and God. And that was, only, that was brought about by this young child. They brought myrrh. Myrrh is an embalming fluid. They knew that this child was going to die. And we were talking about numbers before we came in here. In Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 5, 5 is a number for death. And you find this in Song of Solomon 5, 5. Death, but it also means grace to me because it took his death to give me grace. Grace. It says, I rose up and opened to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh. And my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh, and upon the handles of the lock. They knew that myrrh was an embalming fluid. When, when uh, Nicodemus and uh, Joseph of Arimathea took the body of Christ, they took myrrh, and they embalmed him with myrrh. But you say, well, how did they know he was going to die? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. And excuse me if I get teary-eyed when I read this, because every time I read the book of Isaiah 53, I cry. Because this is what Christ did for me. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He was going to die for my sins, but he wasn't going to stay dead. He was going to rise again. And these, these wise men knew what was going to take place. They knew that this world needed a God-man to rule over them. They knew that they needed a God-man to be their priest. They knew that they needed a God-man that would pay the price for their sins. They knew all this from reading the Word of God, the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. All they had was part of the Old Testament. But they found all this information in the Old Testament. There are over 300 prophecies in the Bible concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ. Over 300 prophecies. If you only took 48 of those prophecies and you 
calculated the odds of that happening to one person, one place, at a Pacific time, just for 48 of them, it would take one with 170 zeros behind it. No one would bet on those odds, but it happened, just as the Bible said it would happen. And not just 48, but 300. We're living in the Laodicea church age. Man is, is doing what seems right in his own eyes. But if you're not going by the word of God, you're going to fail terribly. This is what he says to the Laodicea church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I love my Lord. I love what he's, he's given me. And I will not compromise. I won't compromise my music. I will not compromise Amen. his word. And I will not compromise righteous living. Because if you compromise one of those, what are you doing to your Savior? Who gave everything for you. Who gave it all for us. That we might have eternal life and... and Inherit a kingdom with him. Let's be wise men. I want to be a wise man. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this lesson. Thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And Lord... I mean it when I say it. I don't want to compromise. I want to be all that you want me to be. And I don't care about what the world says or what the world thinks. I don't care what anybody in this place thinks. I care about what you, your word has to say. Lord, I pray that you'll open our ears and our eyes. Let your word come into us. And Lord, help us to read it, to believe it, and most important, to act upon it. Lord, I love you and I praise your name. Bless the speaker that's coming to preach to us, Lord. I pray that you'll empower him with the Holy Spirit. For us in Jesus Christ, amen.